This was so much more than just a world championship. It was something that transcended the sports pages. And after 50 years, uh, does the magnitude of what you did and the way you captured not just New York, but really the entire country at a really tumultuous time, does it still resonate with you? And I'll begin with you on that, Eddie. I think it does. Uh, you know, you can't walk down New York without somebody stopping you and talking and wanting to talk about 69. Everyone seemed to have been there. I thought the stadium only held 56,000. <laughs> <laughs> and they all got a piece of the grass, so they got some of the action. Ron? Yeah, I, I've, the fact that anything is celebrated after 50 years, you know, I turned 75 this summer, and, uh, you know. <laughs> Went through, went through all that celebration at City Field, um, dedicating the street to Tom Seaver. It brings it home to you in a big way. I think uh, for Eddie and myself who live in the area, you know, it's, it's every day, like you said, somebody talks to us about that team. You know, I played 13 years, Eddie played 18 years and plus some years in the minors, and Ronnie played a lot of years, and nobody ever talks about the other years. Nobody ever talks about the other 12. It's really about 1969, and we get writers like Mike who, who remember it and what, for what it was and how important it was to not only the city but the country. And it's uh, and, and a team that 50 years later, as Ronnie said, resonates with people because of what we did and what, how we made people feel about what was going on in their lives at a time that was really dark in the city and the country. And, Kids who weren't even born know about that team from their parents and their grandparents because it was such a, a notable team and one of the most iconic teams in the history of baseball. I know it sounds uh, jaded, but uh, to be part of it and still talk about it 50 years later is just incredible. After that season, Mike, I went on a USO tour to Vietnam and, and we talked to all kinds of young kids, 18 years old, who had listened to the game. They, I went in 68, they didn't really know who I was. I was there with, <laughs> I was there with Joe DiMaggio, Mr. Coffee. <laughs> and, and, and in 1969, you know, when you had dinner with Creighton Abrams, the general of the whole affair, he knew who you were. And, and when you got out in the field, they, we went into places where they wouldn't even leave the helicopter on the ground. And those guys had listened in at four or five o'clock in the morning whenever it played for them. And they never forgot that nice, still meet guys, grown-ups now, <laughs> old men like me, who, uh, who were in Vietnam. They said, you remember you came through Quang Tri or you came through uh, Tan Sanut somewhere and we met along the way. And, and uh, uh, those, uh, those memories are pretty choice because I, um, I felt like it was uh, one of the things that I, that I was able to do uh, that, that uh, you know, most of those young men uh, didn't choose to be in that situation, and we went over there to at least show them we hadn't forgotten. So there was so much going on um, in the country around that time. 68, of course, Robert Kennedy was assassinated, Martin Luther King, 1969, Vietnam was in full swing, race riots. I mean, the country was just being torn apart. The city of New York was in financial distress at the time. It's really easy, I think, to sit back 50 years later and look at it and say, okay, that was really a big part of what happened in the city. But as it was unfolding and everything was going on in the country, did you realize how important your place was uh, to just bringing some happiness to not just New Yorkers, but the whole country really got behind the 69 Mets art? Well, I think at the time, we, you know, we were ball players in this arena and caught up like fans were with the excitement from being in a pennant race and, and all the things that were going on, but subsequently we, we all realized how important we were to the city and the country at the time. It, it was just an amazing feeling over the years to have people come up to you and not even want anything, just say thank you. Mm. Thank you for making us feel better about our lives at a time when it was really a dark time. I, I, you know, I wrote a book called The Magnificent Seasons about the Jets winning and then us winning and then the Knicks winning and, and, and I did timeline events and I couldn't find any good news. Mm. It was all bad other than yeah. the walk on the moon and I guess Woodstock, if you were into Woodstock at the time, <laughs> like Ronnie was. Yeah. <laughs> Why couldn't I be there? Oh, yeah, we, we all wanted to be in Woodstock. 
But, but there was no good news. And as Mike writes often about it, is what we did uh, collectively as a team and the way we won with everybody contributing and uh, just how it all came about was so magnificent in a sense. And like I said, 50 years later, to resonate with the fans and people who weren't even born because we were part of that team, I, you know, I, I, I do think and I know it's very subjective and it might be jaded a little bit. I do think we were one of the most iconic teams in the history of the game. You knew the exact situation. So you make this great catch and then you immediately pop up. I mean, I wasn't as stupid as people well. thought. <laughs> no. No, but you understand. What do you think about that, Eddie? <laughs> Show them what we did. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, my God. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, they were probably all going, no, 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 no. Oh, wow, we forgot you. Oh, but God. a lot of guys don't understand and aren't really versed on what's going on, what I need to do, the play I need yes. to make. And you knew the exact situation. You didn't get Robinson. If you're not in but, the moment right. in a World Series, you know what I mean? Yes. If you're not in that moment fully and fully focused, um, good luck in the rest of them. You know, but that was, that was Gil Hodges because... He didn't mind if you made an error or you struck out at the wrong time. He, he never got on a player. But if you weren't in the game mentally, yeah. you were sitting on the bench. Mm. So he taught you how to play the game from spring training on. You had to play the game professionally, yeah. not like you're seeing now sometimes. You know, when you watch a ball game now, they're overthrowing people. They're not hitting the cutoff men. <laughs> they don't know how to make the plays. He... He taught you how to play the game. So we were a good ball club, fundamentally. He had you playing the game. If you were going to lose, the other team was going to beat you. You weren't going to give up five outs. You were going to play the game the way it's supposed to be. And Ronnie became a good outfielder because he had to work. Otherwise, he was going to be sitting alongside of us. He knew it. And, and Gil made you perform. Yeah. You know, He could put the best guys on the Ron, field. The question I've always wanted to ask you is... Uh, when you, when you dream about that catch at night, and does the ball sometimes get by you to go to the wall? <laughs> I do still dream about it once in a while, but you know how you dream and everything is, is, is slow. It's all, you know, everything moves slowly. And, and uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, there's times, that, you know, I, and I wake up in a sweat, and, <laughs> and it's because I don't know who's going to get it if I don't catch it. <laughs> you know, let me just say one thing. Yes, sir. Over the years, I've had people say to me, well, you, if you would have been in right field, would you have made the play? And I f just flatly say no, because it was a great catch, and he deserves all the credit in the world for it. But, but, uh, so if anybody's, if anybody's thinking about it, no, I wouldn't have come close. <laughs> That's so graceful. <laughs>